there and glad to have you join us on this new episode of Africa Business Weekly. It's time to bring you the highlights of the biggest conversations in the business world across Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm Aki Obakeye. Our spotlight begins with the launch of the 2023 Africa Trade Report on the sidelines of the 30th African Bank Annual Meetings. And from East Africa, Rwanda has bagged another five-year deal to host the Basketball Africa League Series. Earlier this month, the Africa Agricultural Policy Leadership convened with the aim to promote a dialogue on the agri-food policy agenda. The agenda seeks to increase investment and technical assistance support for the continent. For more details, CNBC Africa caught up with Victoria Kwakwa, Vice President for Eastern and Southern Africa at the World Bank. Uh, this dialogue was really about bringing uh, the leaders, the ministers of finance and agriculture in the region together with uh, private sector and uh, other experts uh, and of course the African Union uh, to really look at the issues in the agriculture and food system in the region uh, because we all know that the system, the agriculture and food systems have huge potential. Uh, and that's what we talk about all the time. And we see signs of that potential. Uh, we see that over the last decade, a couple of decades, uh, several countries have sustained growth consistently. And that's great. We also see that the patterns of labor in agriculture is shifting, moving from farming uh, to other parts of the food system. So this broadening of the food system is good and it's good for growth. And we also see that agribusinesses are doing much better and, and growing, uh, taking advantage of increased demand for food, uh, as well as uh, rapid urbanization and on the backs of increased regional trade. So all of this is good. But we also see the opposite side, which is about a continent that still struggles to feed itself. We have about 73 million people just in Eastern and Southern Africa that experience acute food insecurity. And we also have, have about 278 million people that are chronically undernourished. So we're not able to feed ourselves. Uh, that's one. So that's, that's a problem. Uh, the second thing that we realize is that you still have a lot of people, about 65% of the population still in low productivity subsistence agriculture. And then we find that even though agribusiness is bringing value addition uh, to agriculture and the food systems, uh, we're still seeing that uh, a lot of what we export in agriculture is still exported raw, about 75% of cocoa, 70% uh, of coffee, and, and about 90% of uh, groundnuts. So we're not adding any value and we're not moving up the production uh, value chain. And the sector isn't providing the numbers and the quality of jobs that will really absorb the masses of unemployed youth and, and really lift people out of poverty. So yes, we see the potential, some of it being realized, but it's really work in progress. And we still have major issues and we have to step up uh, to really improve the performance of agriculture and the food systems more generally. And so this is what the conference was about. And what we're saying is, it's not just about investments. Yes, investments are important, yes. But it takes policy and institutions, and oftentimes those are not adequately looked at. So the focus of the discussion was around what are the right sorts of policies that need to come into place to support. And we talked about policies in three key areas, where it's around incentives for, for farmers and other actors in this sphere. It's about policies for innovation that uh, help uh, actors in this, uh, this area latch onto innovations and actually use them. And it's about policies that will promote the right investment and trade by the private sector because the public sector can't take it alone. In terms of some of the, the, the key policy conclusions uh, that were being discussed, and, and this was really around exchange of experiences across the different countries, exchange of experiences, what has worked, what hasn't worked so well, what are some of the problems. So it was very much a peer learning uh, event. But some of the policies that came 
particularly Malta's important. If we talk uh, particularly uh, about incentives, uh, including for investments, it's, it's really about macroeconomic stability and uh, policy environment that allows predictability of policies. The 2023 edition of the Africa CEO Forum kicked off earlier this month under the theme Navigating the Crisis from 300 to 3000, How to Deliver the Next Generation of African Champions. For more, my colleague Kenneth Igbemo, who was in attendance, spoke to Nomusa Dube Ngube, the Premier of Guazulu Natal, about the African private sector's role in fixing South Africa's ailing infrastructure and energy. It's significant for us coming from South Africa, coming from the province of KwaZulu Natal, um, with a population of uh, more than 12 million um, communities and boosting um, two uh, largest ports um, in the African continent, and uh, also recovering from uh, a lot of uh, devastating floods that we've had last year, COVID 19, I don't need to mention that. But for us, then, this uh, means that we've got an opportunity to interact with a lot of um, CEOs from major companies, but also we get to tell them and inform them what it is that Africa has got to offer, because there's a lot that Africa has got to offer in terms of the various continents in our Africa. In our Africa. And it's important that um, when people are in Africa, um, they are able to get the taste of different um, aspects um, of this beautiful African continent. The, the theme here um, talks about innovation, how do we use technology, how do we get leaders um, that can lead in the century. Um, so for us, it, it's really, again, another critical theme um, because we are doing a lot as the province. We've uh, you know, we've put ourselves a target of being a smart province um, where we'll be able to have wall-to-wall -wall connectivity, um, but also a large companies are working with us to roll out the broadband infrastructure, um, our schools, our hospital, we're digitizing a lot of our information, a lot of our you know, um, uh, infrastructure, but also um, community centers um, so that we can create jobs um, for SMMEs, um, but also for entrepreneurs. As you're looking at your your, your development trajectory for uh, KwaZulu Natal, I'm trying to imagine seeing all the CEOs here, what are some of the new bright spots that you think uh, you could tap into uh, from the conversations here? Well, we, we're tapping into a, a, a lot of um, experiences uh, from various CEOs, um, particularly around the financing of uh, major projects. We're looking also for a lot of finances. Um, we're working with a couple of uh, companies that are here. You would have seen that Transnet, uh, one of the sponsors, um, is based in KwaZulu Natal because they are the largest uh, one of the state-owned enterprises. Um, we also um, see a number of other entities of other government um, around the world where we are again learning from them how are they dealing with some of the, you know, the, the, the critical areas that we've got to deal with, particularly the issues of energy, the issues of unemployment, the issues of uh, infrastructure. Um, uh, as well as uh, ensuring that uh, we bridge um, these two worlds in one, where you find that the majority of people are poor, um, but yet you've got few um, that are rich. And uh, how do we ensure that uh, there is this equity in terms of growth? Of course, there will always be those that are ahead of the pack. Um, but the important part is that as government, are we able to then attract investors? Are we able to make sure that when businesses come to invest in our in our province, um, they are secured, um, there is productivity, um, there is good personnel that are skilled personnel, um, there is innovation so that again their businesses can grow and again attract even more businesses to come and, and be based um, in our province but also in South Africa. That's it from the Southern Africa team. It's back to you. Up next, we now cross over to East Africa for more content from Fiona. Thanks again. In its latest major market development, listed lender Equity Bank Group announced plans to acquire 91.9% stake in Rwanda's Koji Bank. 
Market watchers have hailed the deal, a move that could tilt the scales in the regional banking arena. CNBC Africa spoke to financial process expert Tony Sikolia Kisaka for more. When you look at what's been happening in the region in the last couple of, uh, of years, we realize that uh, in the banking sector, actually, uh, uh, banks have come to realize that they need to be able to diversify. And that's why you're finding that uh, quite a number of banks, like for instance, the Kenyan banks, have been uh, diversifying into the, into the region. So not just looking at the local uh, clientele in Kenya, but then also looking out into the region. And you'll find that even within the region, other banks are also looking even within, within Kenya to be able to see how to, uh, how to grow their, their customer base. Uh, for instance, uh, you will find there's a premier bank that is from Somalia that bought uh, First Community Bank in Kenya. And this automatically gave them already a client base in Kenya. So instead of uh, starting out as premier bank in Kenya and now trying to get uh, customers from, from zero, they already have, they, they acquire a bank and the bank already has customers. So what's been happening, and you'll find for instance in this uh, aspect for, for Rwanda, uh, Equity Group has which already has a presence within, uh, within Rwanda and uh, Equity Rwanda, have now decided to also uh, procure about, it's about 91% um, uh, of, of Koja Bank. And if you look at it, Equity in Rwanda is uh, the third largest, largest bank by market capitalization and uh, assets, and Koja Bank is number five. So if, by purchasing Koja Bank, they are already uh, getting quite a number of new clientele coming onto their portfolio and bringing them a lot closer to the first two banks because the way it is in, uh, in, in, in Rwanda, uh, Bank of Kigali is right at the top. Uh, second is BPR, which is again, a bank that is uh, owned by KCB Group from, from Kenya as well. And uh, the same thing, they also went through acquisition uh, to be able to increase their, the, 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 the customer base. So equity now, which was at number three, has now uh, is or is now working towards getting uh, Koja Bank, which brings them to another level because it brings them a lot closer and makes the competition at the top a lot more fierce. The acquisition by Equity Bank and, of course, it's causing ripples across the market. And what does this mean for the other lenders who have had a sort of head start in the Rwandan banking uh, arena? Because the traditional way of growing business where you're going to go look for customers one at a time is a lot more expensive and it takes a long time. So how do you then ensure that you put yourself in a place where you're able to compete in, a short time, as, in the shortest time possible? And when you look at a market like, uh, like Rwanda right now, it is ripe for business. And there's a lot of opportunities, there's a lot of potential for, for, for business right across. Uh, for instance, uh, we, also, uh, we also work with uh, an organization called e for impact which is an Entrepreneurs for Impact uh, organization. So, uh, supporting entrepreneurs, this is mostly SMEs uh, and, and early, startup, uh, early startups to be able to go to the next level, to be able to put in their business systems and processes into place, to understand strategy, to understand uh, their financials, to understand you know, the, legal, the, the, the legal frameworks. And this has been happening in Kenya, but as, as we are right now, we have been doing, uh, we, we, had, we, we had a partnership with the, with the, with the University of, uh, of Rwanda to be able to have an, uh, an executive uh, entrepreneurship impact MBA, MBA program, which is a global MBA program. And we are running it with, um, or rather in partnership with the University of Rwanda. And this has now opened to us entrepreneurs who need to be going through accelerator programs that we are thinking of actually coming up with because we are looking to set up an, a, a hub in uh, Kigali where we will be able to support businesses through uh, uh, accelerator programs and incubator programs. Now, these businesses, as they continue to grow, they will be looking for financial partners. After staging a successful NBA finals for the Basketball Africa League, Rwanda has bagged another five-year deal till 2028 to host the BAL series. We had an exclusive interview with Amadou Galfal, president of the league, for more insights around the investment pipeline. Just to continue to um, express our gratitude and you know uh, satisfaction obviously for 
the partnership with the Rwanda Development Board, which was uh, you know, uh, one of the first to really take a leap of faith and believe in the product before we even bounce a basketball. So that counts for a lot. So today I'm very proud and excited that we are going to uh, continue the partnership for the next five years, uh, building on the tremendous momentum and success that this league has, you know, has in this brief uh, history. And I think the RDB has contributed tremendously and also having run there back as our official airline uh, you know, for us in the next chapter, bringing um, the finals in 2024 here, 2026 and 2028, and in 2025 and 2027 playing uh, conference games. I think that's a testament to you know, the engagement that we've seen here, playing our finals uh, last May in front of a sold out crowd at BK Arena, the quality of the competition. We've said coming into season three that this was going to be our most competitive season to date and we were not disappointed. You know, we continue to uh, attract top global talent and we see local heroes emerging on the African basketball scene with some players, whether they're from Mali or Senegal or Angola, uh, continuing to put their country and African basketball on the global stage. And uh, looking at this uh, signing, of course, it's a big win for the sports fraternity for the continent. And uh, how will this impact on investments in sports? And uh, are you seeing uh, an opportunity to expand, especially here in Rwanda and uh, also tapping into other countries? We're seeing um, expanded interest, you know, uh, in, in basketball and uh, showcased by you maybe there was some of the questions here with even at local level uh, teams wanting to you know engage more uh, with the private sector to continue to grow the leagues at local level and i think one of the in intended consequences of the basketball africa league is also to uh, influence or to have an impact in the health and growth of local basketball league because I think the stronger these local clubs and local competition at club level uh, are, the stronger the Basketball Africa League is going to be because we are a Champions League, you have to win your local league in order to come and participate. And I think Madame Claire has uh, said it also uh, in their role at Rwanda Development Board, they see a lot of opportunities for investment in all kinds of sectors and now increasingly as she noted there is interest in investing in sports so I think uh, creating a professional environment uh, where uh, the sports industry can contribute to the GDPs of our countries across Africa has been uh, one of the goals uh, in setting up the Basketball Africa League we see it as an economic growth engine immediately we promote uh, sports tourism, um, you look at the number of people that come here in Kigali every May, that Kigali has become a destination. That's what we're looking to, to build on. And when you do it, and also hosted an innovation summit last year uh, with investors and people from philanthropy, from business, um, the entertainment sector, everybody converging to have conversations around how do we best maximize on the African moment. Um, so yeah, I think in terms of expansion, this partnership is going to really uh, anchor, I think, uh, the, the, the growth of a robust uh, sports industry. That's all from me now. It's back to you, Akin. Many thanks, Fiona. We now bring our original focus back to West Africa. Afrexim Bank has launched its 2023 Africa Trade Report on the sidelines of the bank's 30th annual meetings. Now, the report focuses on export manufacturing and regional value chains in Africa under a new world order. CNBC Africa caught up with Hippolyte Fofak, the chief economist of Afratim Bank, on some key insights from the trade report. Thank you very much, um, Godfrey, for um, your support over the years to the bank and for really relaying our message to the world. And um, one of the key outcomes of our annual meetings, as you know, has been launching, official launching, our trade report. And that exercise 
to highlight how important it is, it's always launched by the president of the bank. So, sure. Professor Benedict Rama. And that's what happened this year. And the team of the report this year is export manufacturing and regional value chains under a new world order. It's the most important and topical issue as we face. If you recall, at some point, you and I discussed the issue of French shoring. Yes. It turns out that that has been one of the most used words throughout 2022. And French shoring, essentially localizing supply chain network in friendly country or allies. Sure. It's one of the outcome of rising geopolitical tensions and great power rivalry. And it has implications in the short term, as we saw last year, derailing global growth. Absolutely. But it also has opportunities. Have we realigned the global supply chains? Are they stuck by political, geopolitical tensions? Or answer to persistent macroeconomic imbalances? Mm. There are opportunities for the continent, African continent, which for decades, as you know, has essentially been marginalized from global supply chains. I want to know how we do that. How do we maximize those opportunities? And where are you seeing these opportunities? In fact, I think as far as Africa is concerned, and there are opportunities in several areas, and they take the basic ones, yeah. the textile and clothing and so forth. I think we have a combination of rising labor costs in Asia, yes. but also the geopolitical considerations which is say, let's move these supply chains, which are, for the year have been highly concentrated and diversify them for greater supply chain resilience. I think Africa is well positioned, in part because it, this is happening exactly when we are implementing the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, which has objective and will essentially boost the competitiveness of African countries. Sure as corporations take advantage of economies of scale associated with that single and large market. And as you reduce those constraints, the competitiveness side, and boost productivity, there are tremendous potential for becoming really a continent that is integrating global value chains, not as suppliers of raw materials, yeah. but as value-adding material, yeah. value-adding input, yeah. into the overall production processes. Yeah. And so the potential has significance, that confluence of geopolitics, yeah. but also trade reform within the continent, position Africa as really the place to go going forward. Next up, data from the Ghana Statistical Services shows the country's GDP grew by 4.2% year on year in the first quarter of this year, driven mainly by the services sector. Courage Bouti, an economist at GCB Capital, unpacked the numbers with my colleague, Esther Wani, take a listen. Well, I think um, the 4.2% the growth rate uh, is actually a positive surprise, uh, given all the stories around Ghana now and, and, and ev everything happening, really. Um, it compares favorably to uh, the outturn uh, for the same period last year, really. Um, and then I think it's not a surprise that the service sector is the one driving driving the growth at this point. I think the the instructive things to take from the release is actually uh, the the construction sector, where you see manufacturing contract by 2.5 or so percent, querying and mining uh, contract I think by 2.9 percent, construction sector so contract. By as much as six 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 percent for 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 the period really, and these are reflections of uh, for the mining and querying uh, oil fields that uh, if you like have have to scale down production for uh, operational reasons on the fields and lack of new investment and things like that uh, to the, also the impact of declining oil prices relative to the previous period. We are also seeing construction decline, and that is actually a reflection of the austerity going on, uh, where government projects have likely stalled because of the debt situation, and then the, the restructuring ongoing and stuff like that, and the huge arrears accumulated that are not being paid, and all of that. Uh, 
Yeah, so in the construct, uh, industrial sector didn't really surprise. I think it's largely expected. Uh, but services, yes. I think you see the areas like trade, uh, repairs, contracts, which reflects really the impact of the dire exchange rate situation we had last year and its impact on trade. Uh, also hospitality services really but then every other sector of the services really i right. think performed and it's it's, right. it's just right that we are having a service-led growth at this point in time so the 4.4.2 growth uh, for the quarter uh, is actually a positive surprise for me uh, in that it could have been lower but i think going forward we may begin to see that the impact the impact of uh, all the things happening now to, uh, reflecting in slower growth mm. uh, maybe for the coming quarters. Uh, before now, the International Monetary Fund had actually said that it was uh, already seeing signs or the, the economy was already showing signs of stabilization. And I was going to ask in terms of uh, momentum, 4.2% a surprise growth given, I mean, some of the contraction we saw, particularly uh, in uh, construction, mining, querying, etc., so is this a momentum you see the economy sustaining going forward? And uh, if we do see a pickup now that Ghana has gotten part of that, uh, uh, part of the uh, $3 billion uh, financing of loan from the IMF, do you see uh, the momentum being sustained going forward? Well, the progress, I think they made categorical reference to things like inflation, improvement in reserves, uh, I think one other thing, uh, relative exchange rate stability, those are the areas we've made uh, maybe some progress. Uh, and now we are seeing a growth print that seem to be uh, maybe more robust or a uh, positive surprise, really. We would have to build on from there. Uh, on inflation, yes, it could continue going down. Uh, I think the shock we've seen or the upward movement in, in May was actually a reflection of some of the tax and tariff measures that were rolled out, I think, uh, this year. Uh, the lag impact and the impact effect are actually pushing inflation higher. Maybe it could be for June or so, but ultimately, inflation should begin uh, a decline. On that note, it's a wrap on this week's show. Thank you, Palace and Fiona, for the regional update. Do catch us same time next week for more conversations that matter to you. I'm Akinyo Bakeye. Do enjoy your weekend. Thank you.